Welcome to the business interview, I'm Marcus Carlson. Today we're talking about a dirty word here in France, the L word, L for liberalism. To call someone liberal in French politics is in most cases an affront. It's often used by political opponents to write off and reject each other's arguments. My guest today argues that that state of affairs is shaping the public debate on France's economic policies, and he says it's weighing down growth. Gaspar Koenig is a writer, philosopher, and uh, also director of the think tank Génération Libre. He was recently labeled as France's most uh, liberal man in a popular TV show, and he says he's a rob rebel in uh, modern France. So welcome to the program. Thank you. See, I have a monopoly on liberalism in France, which is not <laughs> good for a liberal. Speaking of liberalism, let's set off straight away. Outside France, being liberal has different connotations. For instance, yes. when we talk about liberal democracies, uh, that's seen as a good thing for a country. If you're, if you're labelled a liberal democracy, as I say, that's a good thing. Why is that not the case in France? Yeah, it has a lot of different meanings and it confuses everybody because some, had, some associate it with capitalism, some associate it with individual rights, some associate it with democracy. But in France, the world itself has lost its reputation. And now, as you said, in every uh, presidential program in 2012, the common feature of all the candidates was to explicitly reject liberalism, usually uh, specified as uh, neoliberalism or ultra-liberalism, which is my view doesn't even exist. That's the thing about this, because in France it's often associated with sort of rampant free yes. markets and, yes, and no holds barred capitalism. My view on that, which I know is a bit controversial, is that it all comes from uh, the Vichy regime. And in fact, Pétain, uh, was the first public figure in France to argue against liberalism, to take strong positions against liberalism, and to explicitly say now the state will take hold of the economy through dirigism, through planification, and also take hold of social organization. But you're taking us back to the, 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 the time of the Second World but War. But I think it's very important to understand how it happened, because then de Gaulle on, only pursued these policies, as he explicitly acknowledges in his memoir. But the Vichy regime didn't last that long. But they, re, they, rebuilt the, they rebuilt the state, and they rebuilt the way we see the state in France. Uh, what's the connection here to, to, to the economy? Because one of your arguments is that, that, that this is weighing down the, the, the French economy. To, to talk us through that connection. Not only the economy, but also civil, civil liberties are threatened by this state of affairs, um, freedom of speech, for instance. But um, in the economy, of course, what we see is that every politician is, again, trying to, shaping, to shape the economy the way he sees it and to impose yet another plan, yet another reindustrialization process, uh, yet another uh, uh, participation in, um, in uh, public companies. And you see that, for instance, the uh, uh, socialist government created the BPI, which is a in uh, public investment bank. Mm -hmm. And this public investment bank is investing everywhere in the French economy. Each startup, each small entrepreneur, is now the first thing he does is looking at the BPI and trying to get some funding from the BP. And that's, that's extremely pernicious because on one hand, you stifle private equity in France through too many taxes and too many regulations. And on the other hand, you provide public funding uh, to those companies and you distort private uh, the market and uh, um, you, cro you crowd out uh, public in uh, private investments. So basically all French politicians want to to a certain extent, advance they have the, the state, they have the role of the state. They have the same reflex. Each time comes a problem, each time comes a state solution or a top-down solution. What does liberalism mean for you practically? Well, practically what I argue in this book is that liberalism is, first of all, it's a French word. It's a French tradition, which dates back to the 19th century and dates back also to the French Revolution. And the uh, ideals of French revolutionaries at the time was to emancipate the individual from the pressure of the community and from political allegiances. And in fact, Marx himself was seeing the French Revolution as the accomplishment of a very liberal project. Mm -hmm. At the time, not only they tackled uh, the political privileges, but it also tackled the economic rent-seeking behavior uh, by eliminating all corporations in the country. That was the Le Chapelier Lot in um, uh, 1791. And I think if we come back to those roots, which are our roots, 
uh, then we can we can probably shape another debate in France and uh, and boost our economy. But some people watching this program may be thinking this seems to be an issue of semantics, whether or not you're liberal, you can label liberal, etc. Why does it matter? Yeah, I don't think so because with the semantic comes hundreds of years of um, philosophical and intellectual traditions. And you see, when you see yourself as an anti-liberal, as Arnaud Montebourg did, uh, the, the, fo the former, economy, the former minister. economy minister, then you act that way. And I think the battle of ideas is the first and foremost of all battles. That's what you know, Thatcher uh, considered herself. Uh, she launched a think tank before launching her political campaign in the 70s in the UK. I think if we drive the battle of ideas, then we have a chance to be listened to, and that's the purpose of my think tank. You, you say that you've been inspired by Margaret Thatcher, but if we look at the UK, she's a very controversial character in the UK. Her legacy is very controversial. Uh, her liberal legacy is controversial. Doesn't that mean that, that the, the UK, to a certain extent, ha has troubles with liberalism as well, just, just in the same way as France does? They probably have. I mean, uh, the UK was not a very liberal country in the uh, 50s or, or in the 60s, and it changed a lot. Um, and I think I've, I have a big respect for her personality because she was such a determined politician with such strong convictions and she fought against the British and the Tory establishment to carry out her policies. Where she made a lot of enemies. And that only as a behaviour, as a type of political behaviour, is rare enough to be admired, whatever the content of her policies were. And then I think the principles that she founded her action upon, which is essentially liberty, free markets, economic freedom to empower uh, people to you know, take responsibility of their own lives uh, and to launch their own businesses, to be entrepreneurial. And she opened up her country to the world as well and, and, uh, and taught people to be tolerant uh, each uh, wi with another. That's something that the principles that uh, I would uh, you know, agree with. If we turn back to France, in what direction do you think that France is traveling? Uh, the government, for instance, just this week g gave the go-ahead to a foreign company, Nokia, taking over uh, a company in the strategic sector or, or a company that the French government has labeled as strategic, Alcatel yeah, Lucent. Yeah. It, does that signify that perhaps things are changing in France? Well, first of all, everything has become a strategic sector because now tele telecommunications has become a te strategic sector. A yogurt company was uh, deemed as a strategic sector in 2005 by Dominique de Villepin. So there is a very you know, shaky definition of strategic sectors. And even the fact that the government had to give its go-ahead and had to you know, summon a business executive at the Elysee Palace to set the deal shows that France is not yet a liberal country. That being said, this current government, this left-wing government with uh, Emmanuel Macron and others, mm -hmm. is, at least in the rhetoric they use, one of the most liberal governments we had in years. Much has been made of the fact that he's a former uh, investment banker. Uh, he's not really an investment banker. He was working at Rothschild. So I don't know if it's a disruptive you know, new company, Rothschild. And you, know, you have uh, oligopoles in, in the banking industry as, as in other industries. So to me, it's, it doesn't uh, mean much. But I like his, um, you know, the way he positioned himself by saying, if we liberalize markets, it's not only for growth, it's also for social justice. When you liberalize markets, then you allow people mm -hmm. who had no job and who have really the desire to get into the economy, to get things done, to also compete uh, with the other, with those who are in you know, well-regulated, well-protected professions. Today, when you take a, a, a cab company in Paris, and one of those Uber, mm -hmm. you see that the people driving the Uber are usually people from the suburbs who were unemployed before that, and they are too happy to, job, to have a job. They're too happy to serve you well. And the message that Macron is trying to, uh, to uh, um, give to the French people is that when you liberalize, you also act in favor of um, the most uh, deprived people. Do you think it's going to work, that message? Well, it's not clear enough, and clearly he's not doing enough, and clearly they are hampered uh, with a very conservative majority in parliament, so I don't think that this present government will do much. But I think that the opinion is changing. The new generation is extremely 
uh, keen on those ideas. And I have this experience myself. I mean, most of the people I talk to, most of the people who are part of my organization are young students mm -hmm. who understand that the welfare state was built for their parents and ripped them off. And who have this entrepreneurial mentality where they want to be their own bosses and uh, uh, if is either they are even if they are only you know cab drivers at least they can have their small you know structures and so and they are much more exposed to globalization as well they travel much more uh, they take easy jet you know every uh, two weeks so i think those people this new generation the white generation switching from one job to another uh, is also a, a testament of that new movement of opinion. But if we look at where the French population is, isn't the fact that France is seen as less liberal than, for instance, the UK and the United States, just a testament to the fact that most French people w w would like to have the state carry a big role in, in, in society? Uh, doesn't a majority of French people quite like the, the, the current system? Well, I, I don't think so. We ran a few polls uh, which showed very surprising results uh, that people are now very defiant of the state. They feel they are stifled in their daily, daily life uh, with uh, red tape, regulations and taxes. And, um, I'm, but I'm yet we see thousands of people turn out in the streets of Paris, for instance, when we're talking about deregulation, what you referred to before. Well, a few thousands of people turned out, but that's those uh, who are who belong to the you know protected uh, sectors. So of course, they have uh, much to lose from liberalization. But th those who you don't see, uh, the millions whom you don't see, because as Bastia, the French economist, said, it's always easier for a government to promote what you see instead of promoting what you don't see yet, because it is to come. Mm -hmm. um, and those people do exist. They are underrepresented in the political sphere. They are very poorly heard uh, in the media. But uh, I think they are you know, tomorrow's uh, driving force for the country. All right, uh, Gaspar Koenig, we're gonna have to wrap it up there. Thank you very much indeed for, for taking the time to speak to us. With that, we're gonna be wrapping up this edition of the Business Interview. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you.